Revelation 2 and uh, verse 12. And I'll read the passage because it's a shorter passage, but yet I want to read it in its entirety in its body here in this letter to Pergamos. And then I'll go and I'll break it down uh, verse by verse and we'll unpack what it is that the Lord has for us here. And so it says in verse 12, of chapter 2 of Revelation, it says, The angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things say he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Mm. And you hold fast to my name and do not deny my faith, even in the days of which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. But you also have those who hold the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, which, the, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Oh, my goodness. Father, we thank you for this passage. Lord, we pray that you would unlock your truth to us, that it would be clear to us by your spirit, Lord, we'd be able to apply it to our lives, and that we'll know you in a deeper way. You said, Lord, that this revelation is about you, and that in the beginning and the end of it, it's a blessing. So while we're in the middle of this, Father, bless us. Show us your truth. Let us know you in a deeper way. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're here, an apostle, John, who is the author of Revelation, has been commissioned to write seven letters to the seven churches, which are in Asia Minor, Turkey today. These are real churches in real cities that really exist and mostly of ruins, but yet some of them have been preserved remarkably. And if you went there today to Turkey, uh, a lot of the stuff has been preserved by a lot of American uh, universities that have been over there and done a lot of work because it is a Muslim country. But yet, these places all can be visited because, well, I've been there. And we want to remember this as we're going through. And I, I started off when I opened the book to give you uh, a way to view what it is that we're looking at. Because sometimes, with all the symbolism and things that are in there, it can get kind of confusing. So, for clarity, we're going to keep it basic. So, the four basic views on how to interpret this letter, this, this letter that John has written but inspired... And this is how you would apply it. One of, one of these four ways is locally. So it applies directly to the seven churches that we see that are addressed here in Asia Minor. Ecclesiastically, number two, which means that's a fancy word for saying related to the church, okay? It applies to all the churches in every age. Third, personally. You know, there is personal application in between what it is that was revealed about Jesus and what Jesus says to these churches that uh, directly apply to our lives because... People make up the churches, not the buildings that they're in. So it's directly affecting us. And fourth, prophetically. You know, John hadn't seen any of this stuff happen. He's panning out these letters. And so it's good for the future of those churches that they're, they're uh, addressed to, but also for the future of the church age, which we're still in now. So locally, ecclesiastically, personally, and prophetically are the views. So we want to keep our mind wrapped up in that. So as we're going through it, I may pull one of those out and say, you can look at this personally, yada, 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 so that we're applying this in more than one dimension. Amen? And it says here, if you look uh, here in chapter 2, look at verse 1 through 7. It says, first we look at the church of Ephesus. If you were watching, you've seen this. This was an absolutely amazing church, and Jesus gives them an accommodation that any church in this world will be proud of. If this church was here in Florence, you'd be going to it, because it's great. I'll be going to it with you. <laughs> it was amazing. Look at verse 2. It says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and you have uh, persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. They're hardworking, they're patient, they're discerning, they're bold, they're intolerant of falsehood. This is a powerful church here. And they did it all for noble reasons. He said, for my name's sake. But of course, in verse 4, they had a flaw because there's no perfect church, right? He says, nevertheless, I have this against you in verse 4, that you have left your first love with all they did correctly, with everything they did with the right heart. They left their passion for Jesus. And they didn't lose it, folks. They left it. 
They chose. It was intentional. It was deliberate of them choosing something over God himself. We have to be careful of that because those things tend to not happen like black and white. Those tends to blend their way into our lives. One little compromise by one little compromise, one little slip by one little slip. Next thing you know, we're doing things that we thought that we would never do, even though they're a group of things that we do correctly, as they did. And what, what our challenge is, sometimes we look over to those good things and we justify the bad. Well, I do all that good. Well, we see here the evaluation of Jesus. Jesus says, I'm, I'm happy about what you're doing, but this one thing is powerful here. And listen to me, and I say this too, folks. It's hard to tell somebody they're wrong when they're having success. When the church is thriving, when people seem to be getting saved, things are going on, and the church is active in the community, it's hard to tell a church that they need to do something different. And that's why this letter is directly from Jesus, who knows all and sees all. And he says, I know your works. You know your works. And then if we look at the church at Smyrna, look at verse 8. Slide down really quick. It's 8 through 11 when he speaks to Smyrna. This was a church that was deeply persecuted. But yet the Lord was pleased with them. They were in poverty in a rich city in tribulation. The Lord was pleased with them. And they were faithful. And through the testing and the tribulation and the persecution here, the, only the faithful remain. And, and listen to this. And here's the deal, folks. When you have a persecuted church, because of what persecution does to the church, only the faithful will remain. All of those that show up to network, all of those that show up to hang out, all those that want a little bit of religion sprinkled in their life will not be there when the pressure comes. They will hit the door. And left would be the remnant, the, the, the faithful people, the faithful that are there to serve. And those people, God doesn't give a correction to them, but he gives an encouragement to them and a promise. And look at verse 10. He says, do not fear any of those things which you have are about to suffer. And indeed, the, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, that you will, be, you will have tribulation 10 days, but be faithful until death, and I will give you a crown of life. Hang in there. What you're dealing with is temporary. This ends good because you win and you have not compromised. There's no correction that he gives this wonderful church that's being persecuted. And our worldly view was of a church being persecuted. There's something that they must be doing wrong. And they were doing everything right. And the churches that we thought that were good, they're not good when we look at these particular letters. Well, today we're looking at the third letter. Addressed to the church of Pergamum which is being condemned for the compromising attitude and lifestyle that they have in this church. Now, they're 100 miles north of Ephesus, which is continued in the postal route. So when we start at Ephesus, we go 50 miles, we go to Smyrna, we continue 50 more miles north, and we end up in Pergamum or Pergamus, depending on what um, uh, translation you have. But uh, actually, if you go to Turkey today, it's Bergamum. <laughs> it's simple enough, but that's, that's where it is, and it's an actually beautiful place. And it's interesting that these churches, these churches folks were, they're not far away, but yet, I see y'all here. They're, it's weird. It's, it's so that they're not far away, but yet they're so different. They're, they're dealing with so many different things that, that one body that's only 50 miles away are struggling with something completely different. So it's not just the culture at large. It's what they're doing spiritually. So many things that affect what happens inside of a church the same way that we may be challenged doing something different than the church down the street. It's amazing. But it would, would have been amazing if they really would able to communicate and help each other. But the Lord has the help here. But we want to look close today why this church compromised, and why they changed their standing here. And we have to be careful as individuals as well because it's easy for us to begin and compromise because, well, it's easy. It's convenient. And we have to guard ourselves. Amen. Well, let's look at what it is that Jesus Christ has to say to this compromising church of Pergamos. He says in verse 12, it says, and the angel of the church in Pergamos write, once again, the angel is what? It's not an angelic being. We see this over and over again, but it, it, it can be, but that's not in the context of here, but it's a messenger. Most likely this is a passenger, uh, a pastor or a church leader that's here that's bringing this message from John who has written this letter and, and copied it six more times and handed it out that he would have been familiar with these pastors, he would have been familiar with these church leaders, and he's familiar with these churches because he was the pastor there at Ephesus and they would have known him and he would have known these churches as well. But Pergamus here was a beautiful beautiful country here, folks. It, 
it was, a, well, actually a beautiful city, I'm sorry, the political capital of the Roman providence of Asia here, and it was a culture that was rich in education, it was a culture that was rich in politics, rich in uh, uh, the ancient world. It had a library, folks, that had 200,000 handwritten books, an amazing, educated, and very literate place, but also on the other end of all those wonderful things was very religious they had temples, Greek temples, the Roman gods, the Dionysus, Athena, Athena, Zeus. And they also had three temples dedicated to the worship of the Roman emperor, just full of idolatry, full of pagan worship and sexual immorality. And the city was especially known for the worship known as uh, Escleotis. I'm sorry, uh, Escle, <laughs> es uh, I'm sorry, Esclepios, Esclepios, I'm sorry. Esclepios, Esclepios, which Esclepios, I could not get that out. Esclepios is the is if you're in med, if you're in the medical field, you'll see it on the patch or a badge or on on EMS. You'll see them on the. It's a snake. It's a serpent, and this particular god was worshipped for healing, for for health. And as a matter of fact, people would travel to Pergamus to to receive this 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 healing. So there was a temple, and they had full of full of snakes. So if you had COVID-19, they was like, okay, we're going to Pergamos and we're going to get our healing. So you would go into this temple that was dark and had these snakes in it and you were to lay on the floor and these snakes would rub against you. And it was considered to be touched by God if a snake rolled across you. Yeah. I'd be like, folks, <laughs> give me some Robitussin. <laughs> I ain't going there. Well, that's what it was though. And people were so religious and they believed in idolatry that they would do these things. They would go to these places and allow that to happen because they wanted healing. They didn't have modern uh, medicine here. He says that these things says, he who has the sharp two-edged sword. In Revelation 1 and 16, John observed this of Jesus, that out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now Jesus shows his sharp two-edged sword about what he's about to do here to the church of Pergamos. The description of the sword in Revelation 18 helps us associate this with Jesus' mouth. Jesus will confront the church with his word, and they will feel the sharp edges. Wow. The sharp two-edged sword reminds us of the passage in Hebrews 4 and 12. And it says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. And this is interesting, folks, when you really break this down and start looking at how the introductions of Jesus, it sets the tone of this. And so it, it all shows an attribute. When we look at each letter, it's an attribute of Jesus that, that is seen. When we go back and we look into the introduction uh, of the other two letters, it's very different. So if you look at the introduction to Ephesus here, the Ephesian church, it says, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. This is a picture of him being amongst his church, right? That he's keeping these seven stars, these, these pastors protected. So he's protecting of his church. He's amongst his church. He's providing for them and he's keeping them. It's an encouraging message to speak of the attribute of Jesus. When we look at Smyrna in verse 8, when, when they're introduced, he said, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. It's also an encouraging opening to the letter because it's speaking of the resurrection. But when we come here to Pergamos and we see the two-edged sword, it is not a message of comfort. It is not a message of encouragement, but of judgment. In Revelation 19 and 15, it says, Now out of the mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he shall strike the nations. This sword of his tongue, his word, is a dangerous weapon. It is nothing to be played with. And Jesus would use this sword to make the separation of the Christians in the culture of Pergamum that was there. Because what was going on in this particular church was they were mixing these lifestyles. And so before he gets to the correction here, he commends them. And it's actually really marvelous because you know how that is. You get corrected. Corrected, you know, you make you feel real good. And then wait for it, wait for it. It's coming. And it's here. So look at verse 13 with me. He says, I know your works, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and do not deny my faith even in the days of which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you. 
where Satan dwells. And so as he said to all of these churches, he says, I, I know your works. I know exactly what you did. I know exactly why you did what you did. And he knows that for all of us folks. And this is the reason why Jesus is the, the only judge. He knows what you did and he knows why you did it. Okay? And this place here is just full of satanic influence, right? It, it, it is absolutely full. He says, it's where you dwell where Satan's throne is. I mean, there's a stronghold of satanic influence, a stronghold of Satan's power in the culture that is here. Could you imagine being in that atmosphere trying to do church? Trying to have a church? It would like be in the middle, middle of an ISIS camp, like trying to have church and trying to promote change and trying to promote holiness when the world is saturated with sin and paganism and evilness and wickedness. Folks, to say that the Satan is on his throne there? And they're in the church. That's a tough place to be where Satan's influence is prominent. Now, a lot of that, you know, even like today, like we see that in the world that, that, that there's paganism and that there's, there's wickedness is prominent, but we're kind of in the Bible belt where the church to a degree is still preserved here. If you go to other, other, uh, other uh, cities, if you go to other states, like maybe like California, New York, some of these places, the church isn't protected like it is in the South. I mean, there's a lot of cities that are still in the South. You can't buy alcohol on Sundays. There is a certain preservation that is still left for us, but in this particular place, in this particular church, none of that is, is reigning at all. And, 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 and despite the fact that they live in a difficult city, the fact they live in a difficult, circum, difficult circumstances and they hold fast to Jesus here, it doesn't, it doesn't excuse him from the correction that he's going to give them. But Jesus praises, him, praises the Christian of Pergamos because they didn't deny the faith. They had every reason to deny the faith and they didn't. And it's always important that we all make sure that we keep in the faith and that it belongs to Jesus and not some other faith like the one I went off about last week. But really, at the core, what he's acknowledging, he's acknowledging what they're doing well, and he's saying that they're doctrinally sound and that they're faithful. And he says in verse 13 that Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you. And so there's a particular Christian um, Antipas that's, in Pergamus here, and he gives a, pre a precious title of being a faithful, um, a faithful martyr. Um, the same title is given to Jesus, given to Jesus in uh, First Revelation chapter, uh, First Revelation, Revelation one chapter five. Antipas was, Antipas was a man who followed Jesus, who was like Jesus, and, and most likely, I see a lot of commentators said that there's a good chance that Antipas probably was the pastor of this particular church, but he's anonymous here, and he's a hero of the Bible, and. There's not a whole lot said about him besides the fact of where he was and what he did and what God has to say about him, and they're all good things. And so he stood against the attacks of the evil around him. He fulfilled the meaning of his name, which meant against all, which we see that in the Bible all the time, that their name means something that is an attribute of who they are. If you're taking notes uh, this morning, um, just kind of a side note that I thought was interesting. I wrote some stuff in here about the word martyr here because I always get words and they also run. So in the ancient... Greek uh, word martis is an interesting word. In the classical Greek, martis never means the martyr of the sense that we actually see it in the New Testament and what we think of being a martyr. What it meant was it was someone that agreed. Someone said that this is true or someone said that they knew it. It wasn't until the New Testament where we get the understanding of the martyr as we understand it. So at this time, the word martyr means that he was agreeing and that he um, was a one that stood uh, for the truth here. And now we see that there is a, a, a condemnation coming here. So there was, there was some good things, some positive encouragement, and now we're going to get to what Jesus has for them. And I'll tell you this, folks, they first got this letter and the pastor, I'm sure, is reading through it, and they're all excited. That's what Jesus said about us? He knows who Antipas was? This is great. We're feeling good about this letter until we get to this part. But I have, but, yeah, exactly. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which, uh, which thing I hate. Let me say this before I get to unpacking this is this. 
a lot of times when we come through, particularly as people, like, we don't like to be corrected, right? Like, first of all, we don't like to be wrong, but when we are wrong, we don't like to be corrected. So a lot of times, that's what we shy away from in church. We shy away from those things in the Bible. It said, well, that's identifying conviction to me. That's saying that I'm wrong. Well, the truth of the matter is the fact that God's showing grace to let you know that you're wrong is actually a blessing and not something to push you down. And I think it's one of the things that we stay away from and we stay away from deep meaningful relationships because we never want any, so anyone to come in our face and tell us that we're wrong about something, even if they do it in love. And we haven't learned to process that honesty. We haven't learned to do that, but it is a great benefit. But the Lord is handing this to them and you can take this as, as uh, correction as getting upset and getting mad and rejected, or you can take it and be, you know, as a constructive thing and make changes according to what it is that he's saying. And that's the whole thing about walking in the spirit, folks, is our attitude towards what is there. Our attitude towards the scripture. When the scripture says I'm wrong, then that puts me in a place where I need to make a change. And sometimes we would just read over it and be like, okay, that's for somebody else. That got to be for somebody. That ain't me. But yet, true, the Lord, every time we get into the Bible study, there should be something. There's something that's there that says, eh, maybe I got to pray about that and see what's going on with that. But the maturity in the faith says that when the Lord convicts me or something in his word that's convicting, then I need to go back and evaluate that. I need to go back and look at that so that I might grow. That's the whole purpose. And that's the purpose of God's word being God breathed is that we won't be ignorant of our faults that we would understand when we need to make changes. So he didn't ask us to be saved and to walk holy and never give us anything on how to do that. He said, these are my statutes. These are my ordinances. This is my ways. If you follow them, then you'll be blessed. And there's, and that'll be pleasing to you. But the Christians at Pergamos were rightly placed by Jesus. He saw those wonderful things that they did right, that they were keeping uh, the faith in a difficult environment. But he says that he's got a few things against it. Right? Got a few things against him. He says, you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam was a prototype of just corrupt teachers here. According to Numbers 22 through 24, it's a lot there, so we're not going there. And also 31, Balaam combined the sins of immorality, idolatry to, to please Balak, the king of Moab, if you remember, because he could not curse Israel directly. When Balaam counseled Balak, he taught Balak to put stumbling blocks before the children of Israel. The stumbling blocks were connected with idolatry, to eat things that were sacrificed to idols and sexual immorality. If the church of Pergamos had those who did hold these doctrines of Balaam, it showed that they had tendencies toward both idolatry and immorality, which naturally in the flesh it's there. Sexual morality marked the whole culture of the ancient Roman Empire. It was simply taken for granted, and the people who lived by biblical standards in whole purity, they thought you were strange. If you, were the, if you were in this culture, this culture was so overbearing that you were there, you were trying to live for Christ, you were trying to do the right thing, people would look at you like you're crazy, like you're weird. Like you went to a party, you wore the wrong outfit or something. Like, what is wrong with you? You don't want to go do this, what everybody else is doing? Like, no. Just like some of you on some of your jobs. You might be the only one in there. Maybe you're lonely because you have to eat lunch by yourself, but guess what? You ain't missing nothing. You ain't missing nothing. In verse 15, it says, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So uh, Revelation 2 and 6, Jesus praised the Ephesian church for, for not holding that doctrine, to staying away from it. But the Nicolaitans also had their doctrine and their teachings here. And so the Nicolaitans, which really means the, the, the proud authority, literally means the, to conquer people. And, and the commentators of the Nicolaitans also, they approved immorality. So it was another push in the direction of the culture to go along with these things. They went hand in hand that people can do whatever they wanted to do in the name of worship. And that's what they wanted to do naturally. They naturally wanted to, to have sexual, be sexually immoral, just like the world is now. And, and, and it, says, it says here, notice the language here. It says, you have, listen to this. This is interesting. It says, you have those this is drove me crazy. You have those there. You also have those. Did you see that? Did you see that part? It says, it says, you have those there. You also have those. See, the rebuke wasn't just to those that were worshiping Balaam and kept the doctrine or the Nicolaitans that kept that doctrine. It was also for those who were there who did not rebuke them for doing it. 
Because what happens, so those people in the church, and it says that they're holding the doctrines of Balaam, right? That means they were holding it. That means that this was not a secret. It was not private. They were out in the open, and they were performing and doing these things of worship. So it wasn't hidden. It wasn't like they went to church on Sunday, and then they went back home and had a little shrine and started doing their thing. It was open. They were known. They were holding this. They were continuing this. And even the people that knew that it was wrong saw them doing it and didn't say anything to them about it. And what Jesus is saying is you are just as guilty as them by letting them just do it. Let them just go on. Anybody remember what church that was like? Anybody? What church was doing that? It's the beginning of my pastor when I taught it, but it was, it was the Corinthian church. Corinthian church had the same issue. They just were tolerant of, 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 of paganism. They were tolerant and accepting of things that just weren't holy. And, and, and it's funny how you see the pattern of Satan. He'll try to push his way in. If he can't, then he'll try to sneak his way in. He'll try to make an alliance and make some type of compromise. And listen, listen folks, and here's the deal. Just because you're in a certain environment, it does not justify compromises, okay? It is not okay for the church at Pergamum to do what it is that they're doing and allow them to happen just because of what it is. It's not an excuse because God gives us everything that pertains to the life and godliness. That's what he says. So everything we need to accomplish his will, he's given us to us. We don't have an excuse if we go to a job in an environment that's not godly. You are to be a light in darkness. How are you going to be a light that ain't no darkness? You might have an influential boss. There may be people in there that, that man, they, 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 they're a mess and creates this environment that's rough to be the church in. But you're there for a purpose, man. A lot of times we want to gird up our loins and, 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 and just take off. We don't want to do anything. But yet God has placed us there for a purpose. And we're to be faithful to that so that he might be, you know, glorified even in the midst of all of that. But the question that arises, and I was in my study, I was thinking about this, because I was really thinking to myself, like, how, how does the church get to this point? How does the church get to this place where, where, where they're like this? And, and, and how do we protect ourselves as, as individuals, as believers, from getting to this place? Because nobody wants to be that, right? No one wants to be the person that's got all this stuff going on, or they see all this stuff going on, and they don't have the courage to do this. The first thing that they did, I'll tell you this right away, is they got away from God's original plan. And, that, and that's where we all go wrong, whether it's a church, whether it's a person or whatever. And since we are experts now in Leviticus, let's turn there real quick to chapter 18. Because we spent a good amount of time in Leviticus when I originally said there was going to be six weeks and it was like 16 weeks <laughs> or however long it was. <laughs> but Leviticus 18 and verse 1. I'll give you a, a chance to go ahead. So go ahead to Leviticus 18 and verse 1. And so, and, and so this is why one of the things that's really important about understanding and teaching the Old Testament. There's a lot of places they don't want to mess with it anymore. They think the Old Testament is obsolete and it's not good. But it's absolutely crazy. It helps us understand the new. And, and it solidifies it. And it makes it believable. Because if we look at Leviticus, we can see that the original instruction that God gave his people Right? And this is, this is awesome. Leviticus 18 and 1, it says this. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God, according to the doings of, I'm sorry, according to the doings of the land of Egypt, where you dwell. You shall not do, he says. And according to the doings of the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you, you shall not do. Nor shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. What was the point of Leviticus? The point of Leviticus as a whole was the guidelines to proper worship, how worship was to be conducted and how the priest were to handle that. In the law of Moses, what was the, uh, the point of the law of Moses? To clarify the institution of holiness, right? And so we look at the law. We look at proper worship that's in Leviticus. And it separates the people from pagan cultures. It changes their appearance, what they do, how they do it, how they live, how God is honored, how God is worshipped. It's completely different than the cultures that are around them. 
these institutions separated the people from where they were living and what was going on. That God might be glorified. Because the heart wants to be polytheistic. But God has called us to be monotheistic, to only have one God and not many gods. Right? And we saw that even when the children of Israel on Mount Sinai, that, that, that Moses goes up and they, they get air and they suck air in and he makes them a golden calf. That's Exodus 32. He, he makes it go because they wanted to do that. They knew that they were right there after everything that God has showed them and proved it to them. They just wanted one more God. And it's wickedness is in the house. That's in the heart there. And if you guide down, look, stay there, Leviticus 18, slide down a little bit. I'm not going to go over every verse way too much. But it all makes sense. If you look 6 through 20 there, um, the word nakedness is repeated over and over again. The nakedness, the nakedness, the nakedness, the nakedness. And it just simply des- describes the sinfulness and the idolatry and the immorality and the paganism that was in the culture at that time. But if you look down to verse 24, this is what he says about all of that. He says, do not defile yourselves with any of these things. For by all these, the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled. Therefore, I visit the punishment of the iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. So hold on to that. Slide over to Leviticus 19. Look at this. Because I'm going to close this thought here. Turn to Leviticus 19, verse 1. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for, the, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall re- revere his mother and his father. Keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not, listen to this, do not turn to idols, nor make for yourselves molden gods. I am the Lord your God. See, what's being said here is because I'm giving you these instructions because I'm your God. I'm your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. What is he saying? I'm the God that brought you out of paganism. I I bought you out of polytheism. I brought you out of it. I brought you out of these sinful things, immorality. I brought you out of slavery. I brought you out of those things. And because I'm God and I brought you out of those things, live the way in which I've instructed you to live because it's better for you. I want you to be holy, he wants you to be, just like he is holy. Keep yourself separate. I don't want you, I don't want to bring you out of that just for you to go back in it. See that? I brought you out that you might be holy, that you might represent me and do my will. That's the best thing for you. And guess what? That's the Old Testament, right? Well, the New Testament doesn't change that at all. It doesn't. In James 4, 4, I'll read through this quick. James 4, 4 said this is adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself what? An enemy of God. It doesn't work out. No room for compromise there. 1 John 2 and 15 Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not where? In him. You can't do both. The Pergamon church wasn't saying anything to those that were doing this compromise. And as a matter of fact, folks, what happens is this. When you come into church, people in open sin inside of the church, they're doing that over and over again. And the people sitting across from them whisper and say something. But they never help the people, right? They never help those people come to the truth, right? So what are they doing? The people are going, hama, 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 and see the people that are doing wrong. What they do, they don't ever tell them, right? It affirms what they're doing. It affirms what they're doing. When no one comes, and there's no correction, and everybody keeps going along, you're telling them this is all right, you keep on doing it, keep on pressing in on what you're doing. It's fine, we have nothing to say about it. We don't have the courage to speak up and to love them to the truth. Privately, the Bible says. And then if they ignore, then you get some witnesses. And we continue till we get in front of the church and church leadership. But the love says, hey, look, dog, um, you're eating sacrifices. You can't be doing that. Or whatever it is. Or you can't be doing that or whatever. And I say that I love. That's what me and you, we're going to pray about it. And if the person accepts it, great, you move forward. But the affirmation is this is going on and nobody's saying anything. And God is saying Old Testament and New I want you to be a separate people. When you worship this way, when you live this way, you're separate from the world. They can identify that you are not like what it is that they see and that they will desire that. 
Galatians 6 and 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It's one way or the other. Jesus makes that clear here over and over again. Now what's happening in the church at Pergamum is, is compromise. Compromise leads to corruption. Compromise gets easier and easier. And you do it again and again. And the point is, they're slowly getting away further and further away from where they started because of the compromise. And you know what that leads to? The church at Ephesus. You compromise, compromise, and you all together will leave your first love. You will leave it. Small compromise, small compromise. You'll leave, and you'll look back and be like, oh, I completely left my first love. When a church body begins to compromise and to accommodate people for whatever reason, because churches do now, because their focus isn't on pleasing God, it's on church growth. So nobody says anything. You know, it's accommodating. Um, when they don't want to offend because they don't want to be that church that's judgmental. Like, we don't want to be that judgmental church. Truth is, they already think you're judgmental. You ain't hiding and protecting nothing by saying that you're not being judgmental. They, they're, they're feeling judgment from you, even if you don't say anything, if you just walk a Christian life. They feel judgment by that. When they do something, you're like, okay, I'm not doing that. They feel judgment, even though you're not saying, hey, you're wrong. They already feel that. Churches aren't protecting anything. They're just compromising to fill, people, fill up the seats. And when that door is open, folks, you know, the world will affect the church, and the church won't be affecting the world. I mean, that's what happens. Even the church, even if we're church, talking about the church, are we talking about believers? When we open that door, the influence begins to change us instead of us changing that city or that job or that atmosphere there. And the truth is, man, people are looking, they're, they're looking for acceptance, right? That's what people are looking for. They're looking for acceptance. They want to go to a place where they're just going to be accepted for how they are. You know, um, I was talking to, of course, in the thrift store, you come across everything. And that's what's so wonderful about it is that there are people that will come in there that won't come in here. And even when they didn't know COVID-19, they ain't coming in here. But it was, you know, a, a gay couple. They would say they're going to this particular church because of how they feel when they go there. Well, how long have you been going there? Oh, six years. Six years? And no one's told you that you're in sin? Judgment for that. But these people want to go because they want to be affirmed. And the truth is, they don't feel affirmation. That's why they're looking for someone to affirm them. It's wrong, and even in their heart they know it, but if they can go to a place where they tell them that they're right, they'll, they'll make themselves okay with it. Did you get all that? These people are already struggling. That's why it's so important that they can go to a place where they're affirmed because they're looking for affirmation. And that can't come from the church. It can't. Well, we come from a, a culture that's, that's consumer-driven. It's consumer-driven. If people want it, then we do it, you know? If people want to go to a church that sounds more like the world, more looks like the world, that makes it more comfortable, then we produce that, and then the people come. You know, they want us to sound like the world, and we're not them. They want to dictate everything, and that's what's going on in Pergamum. They want to make it okay there. They want to make all that okay. You know, we're in trouble when the church focuses on programs and not doctrine. When the church gets to a place where it will never Never, never confront evil. I ain't saying that you got to come to church and every little thing you think is wrong, you got to jump out and holler and scream and jump all over like you're crazy. But if something seems to be a pattern, so I got to love them enough and be like, hey, dog, hey, I love you, right? You know, you don't care. Let's do this a little bit different, right? Priscilla and Aquila took Apollos to the side. He had a doctrinal issue. That's huge. They took him to the side. He received a change and the church exploded. Because this is part of the reason why we're the body. Because, because when the spirit operates in us, we're correcting and we're growing as a body. That we're not perfect, but when people come in, they see a perfection at work. 
it's difficult to get to that place where we're all in that place of love when we can really hear that. You know, that's hard. It is, because the thing about it is you have to know without a shadow of a doubt that a person that's telling you things absolutely loves you and has your best interest at hand, bar none. And that's hard to get to that place. But if we, but if we are following Christ, if we would open ourselves up and we would be mature enough that we can do that and we'll grow much faster, we'll be more efficient, and more useful for the kingdom of God. If not, if we don't judge it within the church, then, then he says that I will judge it. He will. And, um, man, I don't want that. And like I said before, it looks harsh, but it's really a blessing here. We have to be conscious that of, of our lives because, folks, we have to be so conscious of, we have to be so conscious of everything that's going on in, around the world because every little bit influences us a little bit. There were things that um, 10 years ago um, that wouldn't have been okay, but now they're okay. There are things 20 years ago people would never do, and now they do it all the time. You know, stuff like uh, bring up marijuana. I mean, how many student papers were written in college about legalizing marijuana, and it's actually happening. It's crazy. But it's slowly become legalized. We thought that would never happen. And now the government said, well, we can tax it. Okay. I guess that makes it okay. But things that we thought that would never happen publicly, they're happening. Gay marriage is happening. These things are going down. So we as Christians have to preserve ourselves and keep ourselves from the powerful pagan influences that are around the world. Turn back to Revelation 16. We'll wrap this thing up here. And God is saying to him, look, correct yourself. Fix these things or I will fix them. And he says to them, he says, verse 16, he says, Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. You know, he tells them to repent. So we see that, which means to turn away, you know, turn away, change the direction. And it's interesting that, that five of the seven churches are required here to repent. So you got to change what it is that you're doing. You got to change it. And, and I keep pointing to the fact that this is a blessing because what if the Lord just judged it and didn't warn them? It is God's grace that said work. He's like, look, I don't want to judge you. I'm holy, right? And you're not meeting this standard. So if we don't change, this is what's going to happen. A lot of these churches, this is actually what happened because they don't exist. It just ruins. But yet the warning is there. And God's faithful. Before God judges, everything that could have been done to get your attention to fix that has been done. Everyone that's ever fell in their lives from any part of the Christian walk can tell you that there's a million opportunities that they had to change whatever it is before it fell because he's that faithful. It was no sneaking up. It wasn't no surprise. It was like, okay, I knew that someday this was going to happen. And that's how it is. He says, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Unless you do repent, the Christians of Pergamos would face Jesus with a two-edged sword. And like he said in 1 Peter 4 and 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God, and it begins with us First, this has to be a place of correction. This can't be a place of accommodation. It is a place of correction of help, right? Not like the Department of Corrections. You look at the Department of Corrections, like prison, where no one's really rehabilitated, right? They're not, but they're institutionalized. And I believe that's what religious cults are doing right now, that people aren't going in and being changed and rehabilitated and made whole and being changed. They're made into religious institutionalized people that have control movement that go to certain places at certain times that do certain things at certain places but, but the love of God is not there but yet they do certain things and they justify their lives that way that's what's going on for the church when we agree with God it is a place that cultivates godliness and encourages it and affirms it right and that's why, I, that's why, like, if you go to a place that really teaches the Bible and people really love, you should be breaking your necks to get in there if you're really walking all week because you might be in environments that are so bad, you just want to be in an environment where you affirm the way you live. But I think that we probably live, a lot of people probably live compromised. That's why it's okay for us to go to church half of the time in the month. I'm starving to get here. 
Because all week long, I've dealt with a bunch of junk that looks nothing like me. I can come in here and I can be myself. I can say hallelujah. I can open my Bible and it's all good. You should be starving to be able to be in that atmosphere and everything's all good. We'll see what the turnout is next Sunday. <laughs> but this is a place of protection of love. And he says in verse 17, and he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If you have an ear, if you're listening right now, at any time, man, listen to what's being said. Watch out. Look at this, what's being said to you. Check yourself and make changes. If you can have an ear to hear, if God has opened up your heart and changed you and saved you, listen to what's being said by the Spirit of God. Don't miss it. Value it. Run with it. Let it be the source and the motor of change. To him who overcomes, I will give some hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one, no one knows except he who receives it. What in the world is he talking about? Well, let's break it down. To him who overcomes. But one who overcomes the spirit you know, of, of accommodation of false teaching that's going on here uh, uh, will, will live to receive a hidden manna. This is God's provision that he's saying in John 6, 41. This is the provision that's there, and I will give him a white stone. What in the world? In the ancient world, the use of a white stone had many associations. A white stone could be the ticket to a banquet, a sign of friendship, evidence of being counted, or a sign of acquittal in a court of law. It could be any of those things. But a blessing of them would be any of those things. And the stone, a new name written, which no one except him who receives it. What is the meaning of this new secret name that nobody knows is promised to us? It is God's name, or is it believer's name? Which one is it? This is probably the believer's name. The name itself is probably more important than the stone itself. Look. The temptation, we can look at this letter to this church at Pergamos and say, man, how did they allow themselves to get so far away? How did they let this in? How is this operating? And how did it even get to the point where all of this mess is okay? It's about allowing yourself to leave your first love, folks. We have to stay hungry for the things of God. We have to want and chase after those things of God. It concerns me deeply when we make it okay not to come to church. Or we make it okay not to read our Bibles. We make it okay not to pray, not to pray at all. Like when we make those things okay, we leave the door open and so they're shutting it behind us for compromises to come in. That's how we get to that place. When the Lord saved you and He worked in you. Hey, listen, listen. Some of us are so we're so gone when we say we can't even remember what we got saved. We just know we saved. I know I was saved in August sometime. I don't know. I, I, was, I was so happy the Lord freed me from sin. I, I, I didn't care what day it was. But now that you're in it, now you have an ear to hear. Stay consistent with the faith. Stay in the faith. And then the Lord will move. The Lord will bless. And you'll be safe. And you'll be free and protected from compromise. And let me tell you something once again about compromise, folks. It's very, very easy, it's slow, and it slides in. And the next thing you know, you're not living anything like you were a year ago. I pray for you. I pray for the church that through the correction that was sent to Pergamos, we won't experience it. Amen?